So we are in John chapter 12, and in terms of what was read for us just a few minutes ago, there's a phrase that is said which lets us know that everything is now building to a climax. The story is coming to its conclusion. It's like the moment, if you like Marvel films, which I don't know if everyone in the room does, where Doctor Strange says to uh, Iron Man these words, we're in the end game now. Everything is coming to its conclusion. Maybe for the more highbrow amongst you, chess, that has an end game too. There's a, there's a moment where all of, the, all of the early stuff has finished and now we're coming towards the end. And the thing that marks that moment out is these words from Jesus, where he says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. The hour's come. For those of you who've been with us as we've gone through this series, hopefully you'll remember that at times I've spoken of when Jesus speaks of an hour. So when his mum is trying to get him to intervene at a wedding when the, when the wine has run out, his response to her is, why do you involve me? It's not my hour yet. And he's saying that because he's saying it's not time for me to die yet. When Jesus was radically provocative at, a, at another week-long festival in Jerusalem, where he pretty much said that all of their ceremonies and all of their festivals, well, he did say, he said that they pointed towards him. So when they, they did this big thing where they poured out water in the temple, he gets up and says, hey, if, you want to, if you're thirsty, come to me and drink. And at another point, when they're doing this big thing to do with lights and candles in the temple, he says, I'm the light of the world. At that point, we get this little line when, when they realize what he's saying and people want to seize him and they want to arrest him, we read that they couldn't because his hour hadn't come yet. But when Jesus says these words, we can know this, the purpose for his coming, the point of his life, it's now here. From this point forwards through, through the book, this is his hour. This is the reason that he came. And everything slows down. Everything slows down. The, the next few chapters are just over a week in his life. We get a lot of detail about what it means for Jesus to say his hour has come. And hopefully, as we go through these things, we're going to see new things about him. We're going to let him speak to us. And in terms of wherever we sit, in relation to him, however we're following him or not following him at this moment, there's something for us in this passage. There's something for us in the coming weeks. So let's recap. Where are we? Well, we're one day after the events of last week. So last week, we looked at the moment where Mary, the sister of Lazarus, poured perfume all over Jesus, all over his head, all over his feet, how she washed his feet with her hair. And that is kind of, the whole story to do with Lazarus is what's in the background. Jesus raising Lazarus to life has almost been like the, the trigger point for everything that happens. It's one of the topics of conversation amongst the people in Jerusalem. Crowds are going there and saying, hey, this Jesus guy raised Lazarus to dead, from the dead. When, when he did, we saw that people went back to the, the rulers in Jerusalem who said, hey, we've got to deal with him. We've got to finish him off. Um, the whole city is excited anyway because it's one of their big festivals, but it's excited because Jesus is coming. And the, the festival he's coming to is arguably the one. It's the Passover and so the city, they say, would, would swell in terms of population, so much so that you couldn't stay in the city. People would camp all around the hills in shelters. The, the population of the city is massive at this point. Some people love Jesus. Some people are confused about him. The religious elite hate him. And one of the things we need to see, all of us need to see, as Jesus enters the city, he essentially says this, I'm not here to serve your cause. I'm not here to serve your cause. I've got my own. And you need to, you, we and they need to take Jesus on his terms and not on ours. Just so you know, I don't just know about Marvel films. In the, I know also know musical theatre. So in the musical Evita, there is a song where Eva Peron's character sings. She sings a lot 
in Evita, actually. But it's the moment when she's now the president's wife and she isn't fulfilling the role in the way the British who are still hanging around want her to fulfill that role. And she sings these words. The actress hasn't learned the lines you want to hear. She won't join your clubs. She won't dance in your halls. And she says these words because what she's trying to say is, I'm not going to meet your expectations. You've got to take me on my terms and not on your own. And that's what Jesus is doing as he enters Jerusalem. He's saying to everyone there, and he's saying to everyone who reads his story, I define who I am. You don't. He won't meet the expectations of the crowds because he's about something so much bigger. So we're going to look at what happens. And maybe doing this today is actually good because I think we do often look at this, this moment as the warm-up to Easter. We, we, and we forget it by Friday. But it's so much more than just Jesus entering a city. So what happens? Jesus is heading towards Jerusalem. He does it at Passover time. It's the time of year, as I said, when the population has swelled. The crowds have heard things about him, and they've heard that he's coming. And so as they hear Jesus is coming to the city, what we read is that the crowds come out to him. He's coming towards the city. They hear he's coming, and they come out towards him. And they have expectations around him of who he is and what he's going to do. So we read that they go out waving palm branches. And we might just jump over that. But that's really, really significant what they're doing. When they do that, they're waving something which had become like a, a symbol of nationalistic pride. Whenever they had previously tried to take the country back for themselves, palm branches featured heavily. So when, when they rebelled against previous rulers and, and got to make their own coins for a while, they put palm branches on it. So for them to go out waving this is, is kind of saying, hey, this is about us as a nation. And then we get their words where they say, Hosanna, which means save us now. Hosanna, something which historically they've shouted when a king enters a city. And they even say words where they draw on the Old Testament and they say things like this. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. So what's going on? What's going on? It looks a lot like religious hope is being merged together with nationalistic hope. And they think maybe Jesus is this Jesus is going to be the guy who sorts everything out, who gets us our country back, who deals with the Romans. He comes in smelling like a king. If you think back to the previous passage where, where Mary's put perfume all over him, he's going to still be smelling. I imagine he smells pretty awesome as he comes into the city. Uh, but that's what they would do. They would anoint the king before he went somewhere. They're thinking Jesus is going to sort everything out just the way we want it. And Jesus reframes their expectations. Because what does he do? They're saying this, and we hear that he finds a donkey, and he comes riding in on that. So rather than looking like he's coming in riding on a tank, whilst everyone is shouting, yeah, save us, he's coming in in a totally different way. Totally different way. And we read this in verses 14 and 15 where it says that he's doing this because he wants to draw their attention to something in the Old Testament where God had said, hey, your king is coming. So king, still a king, riding on a donkey's colt. He's going to be righteous, he's going to be victorious, but he's also going to be humble and he's going to be gentle. And in Zechariah, that passage goes on to say how he's going to bring peace to the nations. He's not going to go around smashing them. By Jesus doing this, he's saying to them, yeah, I'm a king, but I'm not the kind of king you expect. I haven't learned the lines you want me to say. I won't join your clubs. I won't dance in your halls. He's saying he's a totally different kind of king. And that's something we need to 
not just tuck away in the back of our minds. That's something we need to learn to. Jesus was not a performing monkey for them, and he's not for us either. He's the king who tells us to follow him on his terms and not on our terms. We're going to see more of this play out in the coming weeks, but he knows his hour has come. He knows that his death is coming. He knows people have got expectations that he's not even prepared to meet, and then he explains what he's actually about. So that, those conversations that happen after he says these things explain what he's about. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes, because I'm a little bit slow, when I read some of the conversations that Jesus has with people, I just find them so confusing. Does anyone else ever feel like that when you're reading the Bible? I just don't get what's going on. That... Sometimes it feels to me like Jesus makes it deliberately more difficult to understand what's going on. And, and I think, again, this is, this is one of those bits where at first glance, we might think, I don't get what's going on. I think he does this from verse 23 onwards, where he then says, now is the time for the Son of Man to be glorified. Now's the ki- time for the King to do his thing is what he's essentially saying. So let's look at what he says. So he says it's time for the king to do his thing, and then he says something which is very much like Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. When he says this, he says, my soul is troubled. My soul is troubled. He knows it's his time. He knows it's his time, and he's, he's undergoing some kind of turmoil. He's troubled by the fact that his hour... And then he says, shall I say to my father, save me from this hour? Follows up by then saying, no, this is the reason that I've come. I've come to die. As Jesus is going into the city, what is going on in his mind is that he's the lamb of God. He's the one who takes away the sin of the world. And God speaks to him. God speaks to him. You see that bit where the, the, the people think there's a thunderclap, but God actually says, I have glorified my name, and I, or I have glorified you, and I will glorify you again. Jesus is about to do the thing that he came to do. He's going to go into a battle against sin. He's going to go into a battle against hell. He's going to do something which links right back to the very start of the Bible where God promises that one day someone's going to come who's going to crush the serpent's head. That's why he says now is the time for the prince of this world to be driven out. And Jesus knows that crushing the serpent is going to mean he gets a deadly blow as well. Jesus knows he's about to deal with sin forever. And then he says some words. He says, and when I am lifted up, When I'm lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. We get this little helpful line put in there, which is that he said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. And we we look at that and we think, oh, that's, that's that's just talking about the cross. And it is. But I think the people who are there get something that we don't. So when they hear Jesus say, when I'm lifted up, I will draw all people to myself, I think they think of something in the Old Testament. So back in Isaiah 52, just before the passage which talks about a servant who's going to be wounded and broken as a sacrifice for sin, it says something really similar. It says, see my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up. He will be highly exalted. Which sounds really good so far, but that then continues about this servant. It says, his appearance was disfigured beyond recognition. His likeness is going to be marred in a way that he's unrecognizable. And I think the people there, when Jesus says, I'm going to be lifted up, they go to this bit of the Bible. They think, hey, we're thinking a king's coming, and you're saying you're this guy. we, We want a king who's going to deal with the Romans, and you're this guy who's going to be disfigured beyond recognition. I think they get it. I think that's why they say, who is this son of man? 
They're not saying, who is this son of man in terms of, who is he, which one of you? They're saying, what kind of king that God sends dies? What kind of Messiah dies? The Messiah is supposed to be about forever. What's going on, Jesus? And it's taken us a while to get here, admittedly. But what they are still saying to him is this. Hey, Jesus, if you're the king, meet my needs. Follow my agenda. Here are my dreams. Make them come true. Meet my expectations of who you are, or I just reject you. And Jesus is saying to them, I'm doing something so much bigger. I want to do something far more profound. And when we start to think about what they're actually saying to him, don't we do exactly the same thing? Don't we do exactly the same thing? God, give me the job that I want. Give me the relationship that I think I need. Help me in the things that I want to do. Here are my dreams, Jesus. Make them come true. Or actually, I don't really want that much to do with you. We do exactly the same thing. We do exactly the same thing. And if we were to hit pause at this moment in the story and reflect back on the ministry of Jesus, we can see that it's all been leading to this moment. When John the Baptist sees Jesus for the very first time in the book, we hear him say these words, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus being a sacrifice for us is right there front and center from the beginning. The people waving palm branches... They want God on their terms. And we can be exactly the same. And Jesus is coming to say, I have done so much more. I'm doing so much more. A few days later, this same crowd, because they don't get what they want, they say crucify him. They say they reject him because they don't get what they want question for us might be, when God doesn't give you what you want, what do you do? Do you kind of reject him a bit? Do you kind of say, well, you haven't given me the things that I really want, so I withdraw from you a bit. I don't follow you quite as closely as I used to. And until you come up with the goods, I'm not going to. If we do then we're very like this crowd, actually. We want Jesus on our own terms and not on his. If we went right back to chapter one of John's gospel, it tells us what Jesus is about. It tells us, it says this, he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. This is them not receiving him. But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to become the children of God. If we were to jump down to verse 18 to find out more about what Jesus is about, it says this, No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with him has made him known. Jesus is all about making God known to us. A few chapters on, in chapter 17, Jesus is going to pray these words, Father, I want those you have given me to be where I am. And to see my glory, the glory you gave me because you've loved me before the creation of the world. He goes on to say that he wants his people to be wrapped up in the love that the Father has for the Son. He doesn't want to fulfill our tiny little dreams of the dream job. He wants us to know God and be wrapped up in his love forever. Jesus has come to give us a restored relationship with the God who made us, to be wrapped up in the very heart of that relationship, to know that we are children of a heavenly father. He wants us to know that God would give up his greatest treasure to make us his children. And we can be like the people waving 
palm branch is saying, meet my agenda. And God just wants us to see he's doing so much better. You know, when we turn away from God, because he doesn't necessarily give us the things that we want right here, right now. Do you know what I think we're like? I think we're like toddlers on Christmas Day. You've opened your, your little stocking up in your room. You've got your packets of sweets. And you're angry at your parents being cruel because they won't let you eat sweets in your bed when there's a ton of presents downstairs. That's what we're like. There's a feast to be enjoyed, but we, because we're not getting the thing that we want right now, we think our parents are cruel. And that might be a confession of mine. I don't know. Um, God wants us to see the big picture of what he's doing. And he does give us a little bit of a warning as well. So if you look at verses 35 and 36, there's one of these little, little parables that Jesus tells where he says, what does he say? He says, you're going to have the light only a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the dark does not know where they're going. Believe in the light while you have the light so that you may become children of light. That's, we should take that on face value. He says, believe in the light whilst you have the light. Believe while you can, before darkness overtakes you. Now, I think this is something that we don't like to think about. But this seems to be saying that if we know that we should follow Jesus, if we know that we should, if we know who he is, and we keep putting it off, and we keep putting it off, and we keep putting it off, there comes a moment when darkness overtakes us. There comes a moment when you've said no so many times that you'd miss the moment. I think there's a real, there was a real challenge for these people. Believe in the light whilst you have the light. So if you're someone who has put off following Jesus again and again and again, take his words on face value there. Because he could be saying, hey, there comes a moment when you just become too solid. And you can't move anymore. In a moment, we're going to move to sharing the Lord's Supper together. But I want you to, before we go there, just consider this question. Does Jesus meet your expectations? Or are you disappointed with him? If you've got something that you desperately want him to do, I want to encourage you to trust that he knows what he's doing. Billy Graham's wife used to tell the story that if God had answered her prayers the way she wanted them to be answered, then she would have married the wrong man three times. God knows what he's doing. He does answer our prayers, but he always gets it right. The challenge for us is, are we going to trust him with the circumstances that he lets us go through? Or are we going to say, what kind of Messiah is this? What kind of king is this? The challenge of this passage is, let's let God be God. Let's not get annoyed when he doesn't say the lines that we want to hear. Let's trust that he knows what he's doing. We're going to pray, and then we're going to share the Lord's Supper together. Let's pray. Father God, we would ask that if anything today has resonated with us, if we know there are things where we're saying to you, you're not meeting my expectations, God, and we're tempted to turn away from you because of that, help us to not do that. Help us to see that you, you have bigger things that you're doing. You want us to know you. You want us to be wrapped up in the love that you have between the Father and the Son. And at times, that happens in ways that we don't understand. Sometimes you make us the people we need to be by letting us go through circumstances that we would never choose. Help us to trust that you know what you're doing. 
Because if you would step into history and endure hell for us on the cross so that we can know you, we can trust you with the small things. If we can trust you with the biggest thing that's out there, we can trust you with the smaller things. Help us to do that, we pray. And if, if we've put off doing what you've said for any length of time, help us to change today. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.